Hi, I'm Susan Kane, and I am so excited to be here today with Elena Botello, who is the co-author of a fascinating new book called The CEO Next Door, and also a partner in GH Smart. Elena, there's so much that I want to ask you about this book, but I want to kind of start at the very beginning. Tell us just what, what this study is, this massive study that you and Kim did um, that, is, that formed the basis of this book. What was the study and why did you do it? Well, so our firm, GH Smart, uh, that Kim and I are part of, has been called on by boards and CEOs for over 20 years to help decide who gets those coveted leadership roles, whether it's picking the CEO, whether it's picking the top leaders. And so since 1995, we've collected an incredibly broad and deep database around who gets to the top, who succeeds, and how. Uh, and in our practice, we kept running across misperceptions that guide a lot of decisions around who becomes a leader, and also even more importantly around what we all think we can aspire to or not in terms of our own career path. And so armed with this tremendous data, it felt that we frankly felt it was our duty to use the data that we've assembled over the years to help really bring the facts to dispel a lot of the fiction that exists out, out there. And Susan, as you've been dispelling fiction about what it means to be successful and how, um, what successful leaders need to look like, similarly, we really felt that we had to dig into the database to really look at what, is the, what do the facts tell us about who gets to the top and who succeeds. And so that's really what we did. Um, and it was very important to us to be fully objective. So part of kind of what the firm stands on and what our advice stands on is objectivity and grounding and real rigorous analysis. And so rather than just us going off and looking at some of the hypotheses about leadership we had, we really uh, challenged ourselves to work with third parties like Steve Kaplan at the University of Chicago, like SAS Institute. So we worked with data miners, with the, econo with the economists out there to look at the data without any preconceived notion of what would come out of it. And so out of that, plus the 20 years of client experience, really sitting behind closed doors with leaders and with the boards and helping them make decisions about their career paths um, and leadership decisions, bringing together that research and that client practice, what we hoped the CEO next door would become is kind of mentorship in a bottle, learning from the most successful people in business and making that available to anyone out there. And, and this was based on a study of 17,000 leaders, is that right? So the firm's database has now 18,000 leaders in it, and it's, imagine, kind of deep, deep career walkthroughs uh, into histories of each leader there. Um, we've taken, much like any research, right, we've taken a sample from the database that we've worked with, and so that's 2,600 leaders that we've analyzed um, for the, specifically for the purposes of this book. And it, and it sounds like the, the real driving impulse for you was that based on all this research, you found that there were real misperceptions in what we think makes a good leader and who should be promoted for leadership positions, who should be groomed for them. So can you talk a little bit about what those misperceptions are and why they need to be corrected? You know, Susan, we were struck, we were absolutely dumbfounded. So normally in business, right, you find gems or uncovered, um, uncover opportunities in kind of dusty corners, right, in places where nobody looks. What it takes to succeed, what it takes to become a CEO is something that's constantly in the public spotlight, right? And so you would think, gosh, how do we get that wrong? Because we've, we spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars on leadership development, on diversity. And so frankly, again, when we embarked on our research efforts, we didn't really know what we would find or if what we would find would be innovative in any way. What we did uncover really struck us. And I would give you kind of two pictures, right? One I think will probably resonate for you, especially poignantly. Um, I was in the boardroom. The board was working through a decision of who to appoint this, as a CEO. We've assessed several candidates for, uh, for that position. And it was very clear that there was one candidate who looked like a really strong choice. Uh, he had a tremendous track record. He had experience in the industry. He seemed to have checked every box. 
And yet the board was circling and circling and circling, it just weren't comfortable until the lead director finally said, Elena, I get it, he's been really successful, but he's just such an introvert. I'm just really concerned because this is a large company, it's a global business. How is this person going to lead the troops? In the 21st century, right? Frankly, after all the work that you've done, to think that people at the very top who are empowered to make these decisions for putting people in power, that such a basic thing as extroversion and introversion is still kind of a predominant myth out there. It was really striking. So then when we looked at the data, we actually uncovered a lot of different myths that really, really shocked us. So one of them is the fact that we all have this picture in our minds, or many of us do, of this charismatic, larger-than-life personality who rides in on a white horse and just with a force of natural charisma, uh, you know, gets, gets the troops to follow them through hell and high water. Well, you better than anyone know that that's not the case, right? Uh, in our research, for example, just around this myth of charisma and extroversion, when we looked at the output, when we looked at the results leaders deliver, introverted leaders were not any less successful than the extroverts once they got the job. Now, getting the job is actually easier for a charismatic, likable, overtly kind of connect, easily connecting individual. But when, it, when you look at who actually delivers results, frankly, at the outperform, at the very top of performance, introverts were even slightly overrepresented. Um, but here's just one basic thing that we, you know, we all think we know what a strong leader looks like, but even something as basic as that, the facts just flew in the face of uh, convention. The other piece that I think many of us assume is, we think if you, you know, if I ask many folks, so. How, what do you picture? What, what's a picture that stands out in your mind when you think of someone who will become CEO eventually? I think many of us think of that kid in high school who was voted most likely to succeed, or that annoying person in any group meeting, they somehow found themselves at the door, at, at, the, at the whiteboard, right? And they took charge, right? And you're, you're laughing. It's so, it's so easy to picture that. Well, yet we've interviewed the CEOs, about 30% of them knew that they had they set a goal for becoming a CEO fairly early in their life. 70% had no idea who they wanted to become when they grow up, right? Outside of their applications that I'm sure they had to fill out with, you know, their, their lofty visions. They showed up to work every day. They practiced the behaviors that we later uncovered were really instrumental. Uh, and only when they became, when they got within earshot of the CEO role, did this aspiration become relevant for them. And so, Especially for women, I often hear women saying, well, gosh, I don't know if I'm cut out to be CEO. Well, the point is 70% of the CEOs out there actually didn't know they were cut out to be CEO until they got really, really close to the role. I want to really uh, dig down and ask you more about that 70% because I was really struck by it. And, and the statistics being what they are, most of the people listening to us today will find themselves in that 70%, right? Did you Absolutely. find that that 70% tended to be generally ambitious by nature, maybe thinking, well, I can't be CEO, but, I, but I'm generally kind of a go-getting type of person. Or were some of these people really just completely taken by surprise about the direction that their, their career paths took? You know, these folks were all ambitious in different ways, but their ambition didn't always necessarily focus on their career trajectory. So I find, and we have a lot of dialogue about that in, in conversations with leaders around, sometimes their ambition was ambition for results. It was ambition to deliver. It was ambition to excel, as opposed to necessarily check the box on some kind of a well-designed path to the top. Although there are those as well, right? There are folks who wanted to uh, advance in their career, but we typically, I think, for something to become a goal, it has to start to feel like it's within realm of possibilities for you. And for most normal people, being a CEO just isn't something they consider in the realm of possibilities until they read our book, of course. <laughs> so one of the many incredibly useful things about this book is that you really, you, you break down not only what the myths are about, um, a, a, about who a CEO is and becomes, but also about the characteristics of effective CEOs. And, and, and then how to achieve those characteristics. So one of those uh, that you talk about is the need to be decisive. 
Um, and then you don't just leave it at that. You tell us, well, you've got to be decisive, but you also offer some strategies of how to actually be that way. And so I'd love to ask you to share some of those strategies with us, especially for somebody who's listening who feels like they might be more of a waffler by nature, um, but still has a lot to contribute. How could they be more decisive? Well, so when we peeled the onion, so decisiveness, Susan, as you mentioned, emerged as one of the four behaviors that we uncovered that were statistically associated with CEOs and leaders delivering better results. And so we dug in to say, well, what does that actually mean? When we looked at decisiveness, what we expected to see is that CEOs were somehow smarter than most of us, or they made better decisions. They had a better batting average on, on the quality of their decisions. Uh, what we uncovered really surprised us because what really made them stand out wasn't necessarily the quality of their decisions, although quality was, you know, certainly had to be good enough to get into the role and be successful. But what really made them stand out from the pack, often early from their career, is that they're willing and desirous to make a decision. And if you picture somebody, and you, you know, we all probably know folks like that, where pound for pound of the same competence, the same brains, the same smarts, and the same level of confidence in, in a decision in front of them, you, you will have somebody who just is eager to move forward, is willing to make a bet, even under uncertainty, recognizing that nothing is ever perfect in real life. And then there'll be somebody else who will just want to crank the analysis machine a few more inches and will kind of boil the ocean, right? And the CEOs are definitely the former. The CEOs that we've seen, those who've delivered successfully, are willing to take a stand, willing to draw a line in the sand and make a decision even before they know absolutely sure. Um, now, what's interesting is when we look at leaders that we've helped develop in different stages of their career, is most of us are decisive in some aspects of our life or our profession and less decisive in others. And so kind of some of this, since you've asked for some of the tips and there are lots of them in the book, um, when if you think about how do I pick up on that velocity of decision making, right? Uh, a couple of simple things anyone can do at any point in their careers. One, try to make fewer decisions, try to make faster decisions. To make faster decisions, one of the ways you can think about it is, well, try to find domains, personally or professionally, where you do tend to be decisive, right? So for somebody, it might be, for many, many leaders, by the way, the domain where they're not decisive, where they're least decisive, happens to be with building their team, hiring people, firing people. That's a hard place for leaders to be decisive. And yet that same leader could be very decisive if they're making a decision around an office location or their marketing budget. And so one advice is look at the places where you are decisive and what allows you to be comfortable and be decisive and then push yourself to the point of discomfort in, in a domain where you haven't been able to be decisive. So take, take something that you already do well and try to learn from that to, to, to push yourself to be faster and make fewer decisions. There's another aspect of leadership that you talk about that seemed, when I first read it, I thought, well, okay, I get that this is important, but I was surprised to find it at, uh, among the top four um, characteristics that you uncovered. So I want to ask you to talk about it. And that is the question of reliability. And, and, and that has to do with the kind of basic showing up. Um, and I think this is an interesting one for aspiring leaders to contemplate because as people get more and more advanced in their careers, busier and busier, you know, it becomes really easy uh, to say, well, I, I won't be able to make that meeting I thought I was going to make, or I'm going to be there, but I'm just going to be five minutes late. Can you talk a little bit about why it's so important not to do that? So I'm right there with you, Susan. When reliability popped out of our analytical engines, we really struggled with it because reliability sounds so pedestrian, right? It's almost kind of like milk toasty, right? Of course you want reliable people in your life. You want your friend to be reliable. You want your spouse to be reliable, but it just doesn't intuitively strike you as a CEO level quality. And yet not only was it important of the four behaviors, reliability was actually the only one that was statistically associated with a higher likelihood of success in the role with higher performance as a CEO and also doubled your chances of being hired. So it's important to be reliable and to appear reliable because it actually doubles your chances of actually getting into the role to begin with. 
Um, and so what was that all about, right? Uh, when we looked at what reliable leaders do or how they do it, first of all, you're absolutely right. I think the root cause, reliability sounds deceptively simple, and it is simple, but it's not easy. It's one of those habits that are very simple and very conceptually, there's really nothing to conceptualize, except exactly as you pointed out, what's really difficult is to practice it day in and day out. And the whole virtue of relentless reliability is that you're consistently reliable. Because without consistency, you're not, you, kind of by definition, you're not really reliable. And it's the single um, behavior that leaders are most likely to underplay exactly because it sounds so simple. We were, I was working with one CEO who was getting huge, huge, there was a huge cost to her not showing up on time to any single meeting. And for her, it just wasn't a big deal because she clearly she was doing important things. She was moving the business forward and she just couldn't understand the cost of her consistently being unreliable. And of course, as you could imagine, everyone around her interpreted it as lack of respect, as lack of organization. And so something that was so trivial and seemed like such a simple habit or lack thereof really was very, very costly to the perception of reliability that otherwise the CEO wanted to build into the business. Um, so two habits or two simple things I would leave you with, I guess, around reliability and something that anyone can practice is one is just actually paying attention to this consistency, to being relentlessly reliable. Second, maybe a little bit counterintuitively, when we looked at the leaders who are highly reliable, they invested a lot of time and attention on setting the right expectations to begin with. Because the essence of reliability is the good old do what you say, say what you do and do what you say. And we've seen leaders step into new roles and feeling that they have to rise to the level of expectations that they've inherited or being optimistic and so eager to prove themselves worthy of the job that the last thing on their mind is to renegotiate or to reevaluate at least the set of expectations they walked into, which ultimately, unfortunately, can be really dangerous. On the flip side, highly reliable leaders really, really carefully before they jump and start executing they're very careful to be very clear and create a shared picture of what they walked into and make sure that the expectations that they're inheriting are actually expectations they can sign up for. So these are a couple of thoughts for reliability. And what, what are the other two characteristics that you found? So there was decisiveness, there was reliability. What were the other two? So to make it easy for everyone to remember, because I've been told, so I spent many years at McKinsey and there we always counted in three because apparently human brain can only keep three things in mind. Since unfortunately we have four behaviors, um, we came up with this short acronym to help everyone remember it. So it's think of DARE, D-A-R-E. So D, D stands for decisiveness. A stands for adapt, adapting proactively. R stands for relentless reliability. And E stands for engage for impact. So the two behaviors we already talked about is decisiveness and reliability. The other two is adapting proactively and then engaging for impact. You also talked about the need to be nice, to be agreeable, but not too nice and not too agreeable. And I think that that's a, a balance that is often difficult for people to walk. And culturally, it's especially different for women to walk that tightrope sometimes. So can you talk a little bit about that? So we talk about it as a concept of engaging for impact, right? And obviously, it's really hard to be a leader without followers. So every leader that will be successful in any role, whether it's CEO or whether you're just running a marketing department or if you're a leader in your family or in your community, you have to be very aware of your audience and of those with whom you try to build followership. And so we really examined leaders who were very effective delivering results to try to see how is it that they win followership. And what we found was really interesting is that they do relate to, the, to others around them. But their ultimate goal, their purpose, their focus is all about moving the business forward. It's all about fulfilling the mission that they've been brought on board to execute and deliver. Because ultimately the leader is there to make others around them successful. And that's what they focus on. As opposed to engaging for, so we call that engaging for impact. The impact being delivering results in, humans, in the human speech, right? On the, on the other hand, you have leaders who work really hard at being likable and building followership. But ultimately, they really engage with others for the purposes of being liked or for the purposes of affinity. And ultimately, while they, in fact, can be quite likable in the short term, 
in the long term, those teams may not win. And ultimately, the leaders will build long-term followership when they can lead the team to a win. And so we, one analogy that came to mind as we were working on the book is that of an orchestra conductor, where the orchestra conductor is there to have, have everyone around them produce the most beautiful piece of music, but yet their back is to the audience because they're not distracted by the immediate responses and the immediate reactions because they're not there to really please anyone in that moment. They're there to enable everyone around them to perform the piece of music according to the vision that they have. And so that's, and then you'll see in the book also we have this niceness curve, right? And we talk about how being too nice or not being nice enough really gets you in trouble for different reasons. And what you want to do is strike for this kind of, for the happy, happy medium, I suppose. I find that analogy of the orchestra conductor really, really helpful. And I'm thinking, if you know about yourself, that you're someone who wants to hear the beautiful music, but your primary uh, drive in life, let's say, is more to connect with each individual member of, of the orchestra, is the right answer for that person? Well, maybe leadership actually isn't the role that that they most want to do. And maybe they would be most fulfilled and contribute the most deeply in a different role where they can satisfy their kind of um, wish for affinity in a more direct way. It's a really good observation, Susan, because ultimately, you're right, I think we're all at our best when we do what fits with our values, what fits with our natural instincts and affinities, right, in the long run. Um, and so if being liked is really important to you, I mean, there's, there are lots of leaders for whom that is important and they do manage to be successful, uh, but it's a struggle for them because ultimately I think those who are able to relate, who love relating to others, but ultimately are able to make the tough calls are those who understand that in a leadership role, their job is not to please any one person, but it's to make the full team, whatever that team happens to be successful. And so ultimately, they see their role is to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the whole, of the whole, even if that disrupts the apple cart with individuals. You've said that you want this book to be a kind of, I can do this moment for aspiring leaders. And so I wondered if you could share with us a story of someone who maybe thought of themselves as a kind of unlikely leader, but ended up rising to that position and, and doing well. What's interesting is that most leaders I work with or most CEOs I work with only look destined for success in hindsight. So when you look at them now that they are on the front pages of the Wall Street Journal, now that they are by all accounts successful, it's easy to rationalize their history, look back and say, well, gosh, here's how all the steps added up. But actually, if you cut the tape, if you cut the recording, if you will, at any point in time and had to predict their success, it would be much less obvious because every single leader we work with, and we always joke around that the only perfect CEOs we know or the only perfect leaders or the only perfect human beings are those who we don't actually know all that well. And so in a way, if you, if you uh, really looked closely at any of the CEOs that were included in the research, you would ca picture yourself in the worst moment of your career, in the absolute disaster moment when your heart was pounding or it was in your stomach and, and you thought of yourself as an absolute and utter failure. And you know, maybe there are people out there who never feel this way, but I could certainly, when I describe that moment, you know, my blood pressure is going up because I've had many of those moments myself. And just know that having assessed, so personally I've, I've advised and, and assessed over 200 CEOs, in the research, we've looked at 2,600 leaders. Every one of them has gone through multiple hair-raising experiences like that. And every one of them, if you caught them in that moment, would be an absolutely unlikely success story. What was interesting is we looked at um, mistakes made by uh, leaders, and we found that 45% of them, not 100% of them made mistakes. And part of our interview methodology really spends a lot of time understanding those mistakes because they're part of understanding a leader. But 45% of them had huge blow ups. So not just, so a mistake would be something like, well, gosh, we overspend our marketing budget by 10%, right? 45% that had blow ups, it looks something like Andy Silvernail, for example, and Andy is one of the CEOs we mentioned in the book. 
Um, he's the CEO of IDEX, one of the very successful middle market companies. Uh, he's had a very successful run. He's delivered and outperformed for his shareholders. But if you caught him on his first, in his first month or his first quarter in the role, what you would see is that actually Andy just made a huge mistake in an acquisition that he made. It was about a couple of hundred million dollars of shareholder value that he basically tanked because of the deal that he made. And imagine picture walking into that as a first experience as a CEO. And yet, you know, today again, Andy has lived to tell the story. And so what we've learned is every one of them has have had hair raising moments. And actually, somebody listening to this might say, well, so how do I know if I'm, you know, I'm living one right now. How do I know if I will emerge uh, victorious and successful or if it will become my undoing? What was really interesting, um, our research showed that it's actually not the nature of the mistake itself. I mean, short of, you know, crimes and misdemeanors, right? But it's really not the nature of the mistake itself. It's how the leader dealt with the mistake, and how they processed it, how they thought about it, how they handled it with their stakeholders that really differentiated those who use this mistake to become kind of a forging experience to get stronger around these four behaviors we talk about and really advance ultimately in their career from those who actually petered out over time. So what is the best thing that you should do after you've just made an embarrassing mistake? What should you say to your stakeholders? Well, first of all, owning it is a really important piece, right? Is being able to own it and being able to apologize. We have a whole section in the book uh, reviewing the good old art of apology, which probably is useful to all of us personally, not just professionally. Um, and then being able to distance yourself from this feeling of whether you're feeling shame or you're feeling paranoia or you're feeling that the world is about to come to an end, but really try to distance yourself emotionally and look at it in a factual way. And first of all, ask yourself a question of how do I steer the ship to, on the right course right now, given what we see? And then second, as soon as possible, how do I learn from this? Because you've already paid your tuition, so don't let that tuition go to waste. Uh, and if you assume that you're going to succeed ultimately in the long run, and you know whether it's going to be 10 months or 10 years, that this mistake is going to be something you can look back at with a newly found wisdom, well, what is that wisdom that you can find from this mistake? And we think it's because seeing it as a failure really added to that sense of shame and really made it harder for them to learn. They wanted to kind of put it away, put it in the bag and not come back to it versus thinking of it as a mistake that objectively could have been a disaster. They can even talk about it as, well, gosh, that was, that was, that day was a disaster. I, you know, this didn't go well. Uh, but it was interesting because the, the use of the word failure in, in thinking and processing that those mistakes was associated with worse outcomes. Yeah. You know, that was really interesting to me because I think failure has become a, become a kind of buzzword recently in the business press. You know, there's an idea of we should own our failures, we should celebrate them, you can't succeed without having lots of failures along the way. Um, so it was interesting to me to think about, well, maybe the language that you use matters and talk about mistakes yeah. rather than failures. And look, I, I would hate for people to take away kind of an interview tip from that. I think fundamentally that language was just a representation of how people thought about it. So I think language is, in this case is only important as a reflection of your thinking. How receptive have you found boards and other people in charge of appointing leaders to be in, in taking in this data? So, you know, the next time that they're presented with a candidate who didn't go to the fanciest business school and doesn't have the charismatic extroverted personality, um, but is a fantastic candidate in all the other ways, um, how... How open are they to overlooking those typical biases? You know, as much as I'd love to think that the book will change the world for the better overnight, that certainly won't happen. Uh, and all the common reasons that could be valid reasons or excuses when they're used as excuses are still out there, right? Around the fact that, well, gosh, we would love to have a minority candidate. We just don't have them in the pipeline, right? Um, so clearly, as much as I'd love to change the world, it will not happen overnight. However, what I absolutely have found is, look, most boards feel tremendous sense of responsibility for making the right decision. And most boards actually, when presented with facts, we have a whole conversation now, when I advise boards around succession or selection, um, we have a whole conversation about biases. And we talk about the fact that, well, isn't that interesting? Just one of the biases you could be aware of is that pound for pound of the same capability, foreign accent makes you 12 times less likely to get the job. 
And I know you guys have a brilliant diversity program and so did everyone else in our data set, right? And so what that does, it just raises a sense of awareness and when there's awareness, there's better decision making. We have, so what it's allowed us to do is have a set of very fact-based, research-based conversations around things that do matter for performance, like the four behaviors and how to look for them. And also interestingly, sometimes somebody who will be a strong CEO may upset the apple cart too much when they're coming up through the ranks. And so we talk about what does decisiveness look like that may pay off and be really an asset once someone becomes a CEO, but now that they're a middle manager, people are kind of frustrated because they're too decisive, right? And so it allowed us to have a fact-based conversation about what to look for, how to find it, how to measure it, how to be objective, and also what to guard against, which is, oh, gee, you know, isn't that guy likable and charismatic? Or isn't that woman, you know, just perfectly fitting your kind of stereotypical cast? Well, let's be careful. Let's make sure that we're paying attention to the data. So it's led to more fact-based conversation, which, you know, coming from a family of mathematicians and spending my life bringing facts to leadership, I've seen lead to better decisions already. Well, Elena, thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating, and I really hope that your findings go far and deep into the world. Thanks.